Hey folks, welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. Today I have an interview with my friend, uh, Damien Marie Athope. Uh, Damien is an activist turned educator who has spent many years uh, working for social justice in various ways. He has spent the last few years uh, learning about prehistory and spreading information about the history of religion from the time before it became dominant. He has studied prehistory and talked to many archaeologists and anthropologists who appreciated his work and his understanding of prehistoric times. In this interview, we talk about his growth and the uh, worldview he now holds, including his path to atheism and anarchism, while touching on his mode of thinking, which is he describes as axiology. For more information on axiology, you can go watch Damien's videos on his channel, which will be in the show notes on, uh, or the description box of this episode. We didn't spend much time on Damien's activism and what he has done for communities, uh, his communities, so we're going to be doing a second interview uh, I hope that you appreciate him and, and his work as much as I do. Uh, so once again, I'm not doing an intro rant. I'm definitely trying to focus on my attempt to do a video essay. So I won't um, <clears throat> be doing hot takes for a while. I love talking to people though. So I am going to continue the interview series as I work on my theory project. Uh, so I don't know if I've properly thanked my patrons at this point. And I can only remember the most recent one. So here's a big thank you to Scott for becoming a patron at the dispossessed level and supporting my work. I'm also going to rattle off the name of my other patrons quickly. So as a thank you uh, for their continued support. So thank you to Scott, Some Random Geek, Christopher, Damien, Dan, Lisa, Justin, Kim, Bodacious Void, Occulte Veritatis, Richard, Sean, Dan W, Daryl, Driffa, Felicia, Freethinker215, Humboldt, McNutwack, Peter, Phaedrus, Sienna, uh, the Postmodern Polymaths Podcast, and Thomas, Zach, and HQ, or HG. Uh, thank you all so much for your continued support. Uh, I'm sure we don't all agree on everything, but your support means a lot to me, and uh, it keeps me working to get better and, and create better content. If you like what I do, then you can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist. Any support at all is appreciated. And if you can't support me with money, then hit the like button on the video or go and write a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. Feel free to contact me on social media, leave me a message on uh, comment on YouTube if you don't mind it being public, uh, or you can contact use the contact form on my website, skepticalleftist.com, or you can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And now, on to the interview. All right, hi and welcome to uh, The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by my friend, Damien Marie at home. Hi, I'm Damien Marie at home. <laughs> How's it going? It's going great, actually. Things are getting Good. better. That's awesome. Yeah. Enjoying the new house? Yeah, as you can see in the back, I have red wall and a blue wall, and I need to get the ceiling black, but uh, just takes time to paint things and yep no fair enough so i guess for people who might not uh see us chat every two weeks i better get you to introduce yourself <laughs> all right i'm damien marie at hope and um that's not my birth name so people know um i was born um actually joseph daniel tolosi but i don't remember exactly what age maybe it was nine years old um, I had a, um, I want to say stepdad, but that's not totally correct. It, it was a um, person that my mom was dating that eventually I just accepted or, or adopted as my stepdad, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. And definitely was a, a, a father to me that my real father was not. My real father was so terrible that at nine years old, I just said I refused to have his last name. I hated him with a passion. And so I, just, I started calling myself. You know, my mom's boyfriend, which eventually became, you know, my stepdad in a sense. I, I just started using the last name Sturt. I didn't care. I, I but I, I'm also, <laughs> I, I'm a, um, a high functioning sociopath, and uh, generally, it's not like a. In a sense, let me explain real quick. A sociopath and a psychopath. A psychopath means that you have like a mental disorder generally that you're born with. Sociopaths are generally created. In other words, it's like a form of uh, extreme PTSD. Mm -hmm. When you experience this cer certain uh, instances, some people break and get, um, you know, dissociative personalities, or some people become PTSD in the sense of where everything bothers them. They become very, you know, in a sense, fragile or, 
you know, hurt or, or emotional about things. Well, right. I'm like the opposite of that. That's like so many things happen to me. The emotions shut off and I become like dead inside. So it's, it, it's pe- things people don't, don't really have. And it's like, it's like the best way to explain how it feels takes to me. It's like the volume of emotions is turned way, way down. Right. I hear it, but eh, I can know. I can ignore it if I don't really want to hear it. But that also means but the, the thing is, though, when you shut off emotions like that, it's not like it shuts off just one kind of emotions. It shuts off all of them. Right. So I didn't feel very much love. I didn't feel care. I didn't feel hate. I didn't feel. I just felt nothing. Like like a black hole was just laying in my chest, and everything just fell into it and went nowhere. Okay. So and and I became very aggressive because anything that that, that I felt was um, in a sense against me or something, I just took it very aggressively. I uh, my first uh, suspension for fighting was in um, kindergarten, which actually I took twice because I failed the first time because I just wouldn't do anything because mm-hmm. I just didn't care. And I, I and I and I had a very in a sense not caring attitude. I, I became um, actually. Um, more well in my thinking, I should say, Mm. Um, really was uh, not because of force or violence like the state, you know, kind of a a depression from the the top down, but actually was just genuine care. I I was in a rehab and I I wanted to do drugs still. I I, I was a crack addict. I mean, I had all kinds of things. And um, I wanted to be, in fact, I, I was on homicidal awareness for my first, I think, two weeks or a month that I was in there. I was in there two months, two and a half. Oh, well. Because um, my roommate laughed at me because I was coming down off of, off of um, I think it was like six or seven hits of LSD. And I, 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 I was hurting really, really bad, you know, because it must have had like strychnine or just my body suffering. Right. Not to mention coming off other drugs that I constantly was doing. And this is at um, 17. And um, I was laying in the thing and he was laughing. And then mm-hmm. I told him, yeah, I hurt today, but you're going to hurt tomorrow. Right. And so I woke him up by wrapping my blanket around his head and just just punching him. That's how wow. he woke up the next day. And then then I started making vents, uh, knives out of the vents. And anyways, so this is important for people to grasp because now I'm all about kindness. <laughs> <laughs> it's clearly a different uh, section of your life, right? <laughs> right, right well, the, but I, I think it's important because a lot of people are like, oh, Damien, you're just, you know, a big teddy bear. I'm like, actually, I was a fucking grizzly. Right. And I mauled even people that were my friends. So I, I, I was not a great person. <laughs> I, I, I became a good person by choice. And like I said, so it goes back to, I was in, in the rehab and um, they basically were going to put me in, on into a psych ward okay. because of just so much problems both with my behavior and just my mental state. And someone was, I want to, I, I try to say it to other people. Uh, the reason why I can explain it is undeserved kindness because I certainly didn't deserve it. Mm. And I, and for me, that's why I try to do kindness even when it's not deserved, because that's the most beautiful kindness. If you earned it, then I don't, it's, I'm just doing a favor I, or I'm just reciprocating it's not really that much kindness. Right. It doesn't it, take effort, right? It doesn't take effort. I mean, I, yeah. I tell people, you know, if someone's nice to you, I mean, everybody can be nice to that. But if someone's mean to you and you're still nice to them, that that takes a level of character. Right. Yeah. And so um, I, I, I was shocked by it. What? <laughs> Why is this person doing this? And I, I felt that it was genuine. And that really made it hard, too, because I thought I wasn't worth it. Mm. I was a piece of shit. Why, why would you even offer me kindness? Why did, I don't even deserve this. But that has really helped me to, to change into my thinking was the undeserved kindness. And it's something that I've tried to give to others is undeserved kindness. I just, I'm kind because of who I am. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So it goes back to like my, my but I, but I, but I was raised in a, in a Christian cult uh, and, um, until uh, about 13, and, um, well, my opinion is Christian Cole. Seem like it to me. <laughs> they may not think that. <laughs> they, 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 I'm sure, don't think it's, it's that. Yeah. Um, but I, I, was, I was raised in a, a very strict um, 
thing. We didn't celebrate birthdays. We didn't celebrate holidays, Christmas, n- nothing. We didn't. I mean, it was just okay. pretty much sparse. It was like the rest of my life, sparse. And but my father also abused me, you know, and uh, and so I, I I was dealing with a lot of stuff. And, it, and I was raised in in Southern California, and I was raised around gangs and violence, and I got uh, jumped, uh, you know, by a gang at a at a school function. Okay. Uh, my my life was a lot of violence all over the place, and so that's why you know me having the tendency to then react to that violently isn't a shocker right. I, I but i, I want to make it to the point is that it once again this is not why i became an atheist nor actually why i became an anarchist the anarchist right. actually for me is the same thing about the kindness it's a realization that all of us have worth it makes me want to be an anarchist mm-hmm. not because i want to rebel against something but because yeah. i realize that what is oppressing us is unjust yeah no, so I, I was a I was a I was a Republican from before I could vote. I was gung ho. I mean, fired up, gung ho, and um, I uh, even went and ran a voting booth, took classes and ran a voting booth. I think oh, wow. I was sixteen or seventeen. I wasn't even legal to vote. They said you can't vote. I go, I don't care. I just think it's so damn great. You know, God bless America. <laughs> <Whatever>. Right, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought that, you know, that Democrats were just ridiculous and Republicans was the greatest thing because I thought they were defending democracy and real, real, you know, America or whatever bull crap. And but at, at um, was probably I would say 2004 when I I had voted for uh, Bush the first time and then the okay. second time came. I just I don't know, man. I just I just. It was I guess disillusions or whatever is is the best word. This was Republicans. I thought like, it's just crap too. It's just right. a bunch of crap. I was like the Democrats are crap. The fucking Republicans are crap. This is just all a bunch of fucking crap. But I still was pretty conservative mm-hmm. until um, 2000. But I started to be kind of anarchist. I didn't even know about. It. I just started seeing things differently and just reevaluating. Like the fuck. All these people are just telling what to do. And it just, I just started reevaluating things all on my own. Never read shit. Wasn't, didn't know any leftists, any anarchists, nothing. I didn't even know anarchism right. at all. And um, at 2006, I went to college to be a drug and alcohol counselor. I wanted to be a Christian counselor. I actually first tried to go and um, be a uh, Christian counselor at a Christian college, but they wouldn't okay. accept me. Fucking piss me off. What? <laughs> Why not? What the shit? Here I am wanting to be gung ho and for Christians, and I felt like, you know, they're like dissing me. Right. And uh so I went to the uh um other college and they told me I had to take two classes on religion. I was irritated. This is for counseling. What the hell I need to take religion for? I didn't come here for religious studies. And like a typical Christian, I didn't want to learn nothing. And I already knew it's all wrong. And I'm right. And I knew absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, now I realize, oh, no, that's pretty much indoctrinated you as a Christian, that you already know everything. Don't yeah. need to learn anything. Just that you're right. Yeah. Whatever, of course, it's every whatever branch version or little dialect, you know, thing is that that one's right. All the rest, oh, totally wrong. Yeah. Your particular interpretation is the correct one. <laughs> right. And so, but I didn't even know. I, I, I couldn't even at the time, I'm very informed now, but I, well, still, as it comes to Christians, I'm sure there's a lot more I can learn. But I mean, denominations is what I'm talking about. Right. Yeah. Because I don't really care to learn. So I just haven't learned that much. But I couldn't have named even five bright denominations of Christians, let alone told you five probably religions in the world. Right. I was completely freaking ignorant. I was I was basically a drug addict, you know, street kid that got you know sober, and then became a truck driver uh, for like uh, about fourteen years, eleven years, probably fourteen years, and um, was basically isolated then too because I'm always on the road. I was I was long haul, so I was never around anybody, just myself and a couple fools, and and like I said, I listened to talk radio. Rush Limbaugh and all those freaking fools. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah. Well, because I was a Republican. That's yeah, what you did. That's right. And even even, uh, um, but so that's why I laugh too when people are like, "Going, oh, you just the leftist because you're whatever." No, no, 
No, I wasn't a leftist. And I was late in life, too. I, I, I heard someone before, oh, well, you probably were an anarchist as a, as a youth, and you just, you know, kept that, you know. <laughs> right. Actually, I wasn't an anarchist as a youth. I was a Republican. And so I um, started, like, just feeling, like I told you, that I didn't want to take these classes on religion. Right. And I, I was angry they were like, making me. You have to take two classes. And I was like, that's too, too many. And then they said, you know, one's on world religions. Oh, I really didn't want to. Yeah, that. for sure not. <laughs> oh. yeah, then the other one was on learning the Bible. I thought, shit, this would be the easiest class in college. And it was actually one of the hardest because I had to learn things I didn't know. <laughs> right, right. But I, I took the, the 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 first class. Actually, before the first class, to, um, I started having a little bit of like questioning because uh, learning biology and stuff and science, I started learning that, well, Women actually, in a sense, are the default gender. That like blew my mind. Wait a minute, because mm-hmm. it takes one X to make, in a sense, with uh, considered a biological female, and even men have an X. Right, right. And, and and then I learned that what actually happens is the 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 Y and in, in the X and Y to make a man or biological man, whatever. That it actually turns off. That's the first thing it does is anti-feminizing androgens. So it turns off being a woman. Right. So, so already yeah. that's <laughs> successful in my mind. Wait a minute. We're so female that, that, that a man is actually a, has has to turn off that or else it end up with a female anyways. Right. Yeah. Then it has to have masculizing androgens because if you just turn it off, you still kind of end up with this androgynous female. Right. So, so wait a minute, it's still messing with my head. Wait a minute. So then it, then you have to turn on and make this thing, this whatever, um, you know, new being, make this new being. Now, first, you've got to stop it from being female. Then you have to try to make it male. Right. That's not even good enough. Then you got to have a testosterone for it to, like, finish the, the, the in a sense, maleness. Right. And so then I also learned that all kinds of things can happen in this process. Of course. Yeah. Because right? obviously <laughs> anything there's that, that there's a lot of steps there. The way, boom, <laughs> yeah. you end up with something not male. Yeah, that's right. And uh, this, this was really uh, um, important for me because I had already learned that I was intersex at 22 or something. I thought okay. I was super sexual and real aggressive and violent. And I and my friend told me, oh yeah, so was I. And I got my testosterone checked, and it was super high. Okay. And I thought, huh, that's it. That must be it. Right. My testosterone's super high. And I went into a, a urologist, and he tested me, and he said, your testosterone is super low. And I went, <laughs> well, how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's like the complete opposite of what I was thinking it was he was going to say. And then he, I said, well, how low is it? And he said, lower than most women. Wow. And I said, damn, that's low. At the time, I couldn't grow a mustache as good or my beard as good. And and uh, But I, I he said, um, yeah, that and seeing your genitals, didn't you know the, all your life that you were intersex? And I said, intersex? What the hell's that? <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm a Christian. There's a man and a woman. What? Do you, what what's intersex? Yeah. And so, um, but I felt I was a Christian at the time, and I didn't know anything. I felt total shame. I mean, I'm serious. I felt like I've just been raped or something. I oh, mean, I, I felt horrified, and I felt like everyone now would know, and I, I and I, I wasn't a man, and what the hell did that mean? And it, it just, it really, it, it, it bothered me so much. I just went into complete, you know, cognitive dissonance denial. I just, don't ask, don't tell, don't think about that. Right, right. But I felt really, like, ashamed. Mm-hmm. And that's why now I talk about being intersex openly, because I know that there's nothing, A, to be ashamed about. Right. But that people need to know that there are people, like, out there, you know, that are intersex. A lot of some people, well, I don't know that many. Yeah, probably because they don't tell you. They yeah. don't feel safe and tra- and also, if I can pass and not be, you know, attacked for it, w- wouldn't it benefit me just to pass? 
Right. I yeah, a lot of people will. You just talk yeah. about to get approval. As if you see it, I don't get no approval from this. This is wins me no friends, no nothing. Right. There's yeah. no big community that supports intersex people. There's not even intersex people that go actively to support intersex people. Yeah. I've had like maybe one or two in my entire life, intersex people, other intersex people, and I talk about it openly. It's all I profile everything that have actually even mildly kind of been, you know, supportive. Right. So, I mean, it's not like some great thing. I wouldn't, especially, like I said, if I can get away with people not realizing it, why would I tell them? But so I already kind of knew about that. And then learning about the thing in school, Mm. then it brought up this stuff about intersex again. Oh, Oh, and then, but then they made, she made me feel better because they're saying it's more common. Right. Because what I felt like was this alone, freak right right and so it didn't feel and that's like the one um nurse i talked to before she goes oh you know you should be feel you know fine with it yeah it took me a long time to feel fine with it really well (laughs) yeah i mean especially like like you say like raised christian uh taught that there's men and women and that men are not just that men are uh like the default gender but also that they're superior to women oh and yeah that, you know well and then, and then if i'm not a man then, then what am i and right not, right and, and the really weird thing is too is that my presence or my personality is so is strong that i'm like a leader i go almost anywhere whether it's public or not probably not as much online you can't tell right but you see me in public how people people sometimes will come up to me and just shake my hand no reason <laughs> just because they're like terrified or they're like Whatever the, or whatever they feel this like vibrating off of me, this intensity. And it's real hard then to realize that I'm not totally a man. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? It, it, it took a long time. And, and then the, the, the hard thing, too, is that people won't accept it. Right. When I say it, they're like, oh, well, that's not, you know. That's not what it, what's going on. Or or they'll say, oh, you're, you're, you're just because I'm like, well, I act this way, I do this way. And I, I have some attributes of my body, humongous nipples, like just like a female, and, and no, no, but biological female. Right. And, and, and my, my genitals can be pushed up inside my body, which is not normal for guys. Right. Right. <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, have a hidden, so- I have a hidden penis, so nothing sticks out. looks like I don't even have a penis at all unless okay. I'm physically turned on then it comes out but i mean which also the whole time as a, as a child i was ashamed i didn't even know i was intersex ashamed i wouldn't go to the bathroom i wouldn't even do pe because they make us take our clothes off yeah the, there's a lot of uh like really toxic stuff around genitals in masculine spaces right like uh yeah. shame over various uh, sizes and what have you like well and then imagine that there's shame over sizes. And if you look at me, it looks like I have zero. Nothing shows. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my balls show. That's it. But like I said, even they could be pushed up inside my body. So then, I don't yeah. have knack normal genitalia. I mean, whatever. Or I have. <laughs> Anyways, this goes back to this. So learning at school, just something to get to the atheist thing. So in school, when when I learned about the, the biology stuff more, because I had shame, and I learned about biology more, I started kind of, I don't know if it was totally questioning the Bible, but I started thinking, yeah, I mean, I, I happened. And now they're saying this is can, can happen. And it it's, looks like, the, you know, these, these you know, errors or whatever in trying to make normal whatever can happen. If, if a loving God or whatever did this, mm. You know, but and then I start thinking, well, and my parents sewed up like the thing under my penis that was like a pseudo vagina. Okay. And hid all, my whole life what was going on. They knew I was intersex. So I felt like, so they supposedly thought they fixed me. Right. But then they never even treated me as a male and they never even told me what it is. And if God doesn't make a mistake, then this is really confusing me. You see what I'm saying? Of course. Yeah. You're getting a lot of mixed messages and a lot of. God doesn't make mistakes. But now you act as if I'm a mistake, and you even surgically fixed me, supposedly, but they right. never treated me as the firstborn male. Right. Hmm. And yet, and we're ashamed to even tell me, because if it was God did it, well, it, it, God did it, you know? It right. doesn't matter. Then it's, so, not I mean, a, yeah, then it's not a mistake, right? Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you start thinking, or if a mistake, then it's not a big deal. I mean, you right. know? It, 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 so I felt that it was already the shame that, that, that they were having. 
Mm-hmm, for sure. And so um, I, I just I, I'm trying to show you how I was thinking. I was thinking about all these things before I even did the religious class. Because when I started learning the science, I started questioning in a way. I thought, so Adam and Eve, how could that make sense if if everybody starts out, in a sense, biologically female? Right. And yeah. if there are intersex people, I know, because I exist. <laughs> 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 And then they, they, the fact that they don't mention that in the Bible, and if they do, that they're not saying it certainly as this is a great, wonderful, normal thing that happens, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, I started really questioning that. So then I then I took the the classes on the religion, and I saw that all religions are kind of the same. They all say they have the path to the afterlife. Only their holy books they know about. Only their wisdom, their stuff, their things. You know, only they know how to live this life and they only know, they, they understand what is the afterlife and only they know how to get there. And whatever. I, they all started sounding the same. And I started realizing, damn, how do I know mine's true? Just right. born, born into the luck. <laughs> you know? Like you're born in American, yeah. born in American is born into the luck of being here. So, you know, everything is great. And so I just got lucky to be born a Christian, like, like a shock, you know, shooting a, um, a gun or something and, and you just lucky that, you know, you didn't kill yourself when you're playing, you know, um, yeah. Russian roulette, Russian roulette, you know, just luck. I just got lucky. And I started thinking, hmm, how do I know this is true? Yeah. And does it matter? And I thought, fuck, yes, it matters. <laughs> <laughs> right. So then I, I took the class in the Bible. I guess that was probably best. I took it second. Because I already was in a, a more open mind type of thing. But as you see, none of that really relates to like what Christians would say, I'm angry or something. Even about the intersex, I wasn't angry. I was just saying it's confusing to me. How can this, how can what I know is fact mm-hmm. match up to the Bible's story of creation of Adam and Eve? Yeah. And then also how they behaved and what does that mean? And then obviously there's more than just two genders. Right. <laughs> Right. So I, I, I'm 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 feeling confused. And it reminded me too that, you know, how do I know that the Bible is true at all? So that's what I'm saying. I went into the I didn't like so it wasn't like I went in skeptical or hating. I just was thinking, Well, how do I know this is true? <laughs> how do I know it's true? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I just assumed my whole life that God, whatever, whatever, you know, any kind of thing in the Bible was true, period, and a story. But now I'm like, how do I know that any of it's true? Right. Yeah. So I wasn't. I. 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 I, I don't guess you could. Would, you could call that me being kind of agnostic. I just didn't know. But I. Sure. But I. But I really didn't have a position. I didn't. I didn't even think about it being related to God. I just thought about the Bible. I wasn't even thinking about mm-hmm. is God true or whatever. I was thinking about the Bible. How do I know this book? <laughs> is kind of what I mean. I yeah. wasn't so much questioning God. Later I did, but right at the moment I was just questioning how do I know these stories that I've been told since I see they don't match up to science and what I feel in my own life. How do I know that this is true? Right. And yeah. So, how do I know that this is the path to God? Like when there's all these yeah, other religions right, too. Exactly. Right? So that's why I don't know if it's, you really call it agnosticism because I wasn't really questioning God per se. I was really thinking about the book, the stories, right. the Christianity. How do I know this stuff is, is correct? Right. I wasn't even thinking about the God theism question. And then I started taking the class and the more I learned, the worse it got because they were teaching me, you know, um, stuff I didn't really know and showing the Bible in ways that um, it almost seemed like an atheist class. Okay. <laughs> but it wasn't. It was just trying to teach you the Bible. But, yeah, when you really learn it without, like, all the bias crap, you know, like, the, you know, in a sense, a pastor or something could try to push on you or something, you know, trying to mold you just gives you here's the facts. And you're like looking at, like, a textbook and, like. Yeah, that doesn't really make fucking sense. Right, right. And one of the biggest things um, was, was the first one was uh, the Noah's Ark thing. Learning, you know, that um, Babylonian and uh, Sumerian tablets and stuff, they're at least 2,000 years or 1,000 years, whatever, before had already made a story that the Bible basically copied. Right, right. That to me fucking blew my mind. Wait a minute. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, it seems uh, ch- awfully challenging if you believe in this one story and like you find out, well, so other people believe that before this was even written in the book that I believe yeah. in? Like that's because pretty. Because it is the, the true, nothing true, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's so 
that really kind of made me start questioning. That's why also I ended up getting so into archaeology stuff, mm-hmm. learning history and archaeology, because that really, it, that, that profoundly started to change me. Then the halfway through the thing, then they did a thing on uh, Satan, Lucifer, the devil, and the serpent. And none of those beings or mythological beings are the same being. Right. That learning that, that was it. <laughs> Gaming was done. Whoa, wait a fuck a minute. What the fuck? And they sh- proved it by using the Bible. Okay. Interesting. And and and, incl- and especially what got me too is the Lucifer. Lucifer has nothing to do with Satan, the devil, or anything. Right. It's 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 the, the in a sense the king of Babylon. It's not it's in fact. They and I, I had a Bible concordance at the time because I had, I had an onion page Bible, real thin, expensive leather cover. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because I, I, I was a, you know, devout and or semi devout, whatever Christian. Certainly, okay. was, I certainly believed it. I wasn't doubting at all. And uh, then I saw in the concordance that says, "Yeah, that was a mistranslation." Oh, to, to put it, and so I, I called up my mom. Not even wanting to, my mom was a, a fanatical Christian. Just like, like, hey, oh, did you know this? Like, hey. Exactly. <laughs> you need to know this. Because I wasn't trying to say that all of it had to be stopped to belief. Right, right. All I was saying is the Lucifer part, take it out, remove it, never mention it again. It has zero to do with anything. Right. You might as well just say, you know, say Lagaza Gazi. Right. You know, one of the kings of, of, <laughs> of the last Sumerian king, you know. You, because it means nothing towards the Bible. So the right. Bible just, you know, it means no- So I told her this. And, but what she said, her response actually made me a hardcore atheist almost in that moment. Okay. I went I went from like, you know, I wasn't sure, but I probably was say 100% or whatever to just complete absolute disbelief. 100%. Okay. She said, I'm going to believe anyway. That was it for me. <laughs> What? <laughs> but but I'm telling you that this is wrong. Even in the Bible, it says that it's wrong. <laughs> even in I said, even in your Bible concordance, it's saying it's wrong. Yeah. And she says, Well, I'm gonna believe it anyways. I believed it all my life. Yeah. Huh. And I went, Yeah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> there, there's no way in hell I'm gonna be looking directly at facts and just go. You know what? I'm gonna just choose non-facts. Mm-hmm. I'm just and gonna so choose me, to believe whatever. Why, yeah. So for me, as people are like, well, over, did you go from a point of where you kind of doubted? No. Right there, when I heard that, it made me realize I had a decision to make. That's mm-hmm. what I, in a sense, for me, what I heard her say was, "Damien, you have a decision. It's either facts or non-facts." Right. <laughs> so, as a rationalist, that was done. Yeah, I want facts. Period. Yeah. So <laughs> there was nothing more to be doubtful about for me. Done. Yeah. yeah. This stuff is nonsense. I get it now. I've been shown it. I, I, the, the historical facts, the archaeology, and just the, the logic alone, and then seeing what it said in the Bible, it's done. Yeah. So can, inconsistencies like, this, didn't add up, and that's it. Right. And if, if you can't have a devil, then that, that messes up the whole thing. A lot of it, doesn't it? Yeah. A lot of it. <laughs> It's like I was thinking, if there's no devil, then there's no original sin, right? If right. There's no Adam and Eve, there's no original sin. So there's no Adam and Eve, and there's no devil. There's no original sin. Then Jesus is, ding- is even if, if some person right. thought he was Jesus, came for nothing and did nothing because there's nothing to take away. Right. And then I also start thinking, wait a minute. Aren't we thinking of the Jesus story in a really wrong way? Okay. I started, I mean, one of my mentors, I started using my fucking brain for the first time, <laughs> rationally. Like, someone tells me something, and I just go, hold on. So, the Jesus story is basically summed up as a God, right, who cannot forgive without torture. He, I mean, right? Yeah, that seems pretty messed up. Just <laughs> yeah, yeah. Simply. Didn't need all this, you know, fanfare, ho- hokey pokey bullcrap. He could just say, I forget. It. Yeah. Done. Right? No one had to suffer on the cross and die. That whole thing all of a sudden, I looked at it a different light. It's just not logical. In fact, yeah. it sounds insane. Yeah, it's, it, sounds, it's, it sounds like evil. 
Yeah, the choice of the all-powerful God, all-knowing God, uh, is to torture his quote-unquote son uh, in order to alleviate these things that he could just say, we're done. I'm, I'm not going to worry about it anymore. <laughs> See what I'm saying? How, yeah. I, all of a sudden, I was like, this is sick and wrong, really. Yeah. I, how did this ever make sense to me? Yeah. That's, I mean, I feel like, well, can't you, if you, you know, knew that, you know, or list, read something that it would make sense to you, it, that will never make sense to me. Right. It just, Whether there's a fake God or a real God, if there's a being that his choice was, I need to have extreme torture and suffering for me to forgive. I want nothing to do with that piece mm -hmm. of shit. Mm -hmm. This goes back to the anarchist thing. Right. I don't support suffering and shit like that. That's th that is not I, I wouldn't support it from a God. I wouldn't support it from a dictator. Right. Yeah. I don't support it from a state. Yeah. I don't support it from the police to do it. Exactly. And so to me, it, it, it's uh, it, but, that, but a lot of my anarchist thinking, you know, is I haven't read. Um, I skimmed a few Wikipedia pages practically. <laughs> and then the rest of the stuff is just my own my own thinking. And it's same with with. You know my my, my thinking in, in general, like even even um, I, I'm an axiologist philosopher, but it's because I just grasp it. It just makes reasonable sense to me. Mm -hmm. I, I I have um, read five books that were college level on axiology, which is more than I've done with with religion. I mean, almost any other thing, simply because. I saw the value of it. It's about value theory and it's about understanding how to place and then judge what is good, what is bad, what is true, what is untrue, right. what is worthy, what is unworthy, what is beneficial, what is harmful. It's super important. I don't know. In every aspect of your life. <laughs> if it takes evaluation, being an axiologist is beneficial. That's also why, just on a on a note alone, someone who's a nihilist, I, I I just can't work with because you're a person that says you don't accept that there's a such thing as value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that that also means there's not such thing as truth. That also means there's not such thing as goodness or badness or worth or whatever. And this makes them tons of problems they don't realize because then you cannot judge the system is bad because that is a value judgment. You cannot say that you want to destroy what is destroying you. How have you made the judgment that it's not benefiting you? Fair. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you cannot really make a logical argument of any kind yeah. without an axiological conclusion of the value judged. It makes me think of uh, like talking to the, uh, like, I don't know if they're, uh, Sci they consider themselves scientific Marxists or what have you online who believe that their perspective uh, is purely a scientific uh, view of the world and they have no moral judgments. Uh, they don't want to, uh, they're not moral socialists. They're socialists because of science. And uh, it just like, without the moral or the value judgment, how are you even deciding that you prefer one system over the other? Like you just aren't. well, they are value judgment. Exactly, they just, they just don't call it that, or they just don't do it. That's <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, but well, that's what I'm trying to say is that well, even um, animals value judge. I mean, there's there's <laughs> you don't even have to be human. It's not like we have to have higher functions to do this, right? I mean, th th so <laughs> much yeah. of it is it is instinctive, like. It is. It is instinctive. Yes. And the difference is. So when I say I'm an axiologist, one of the differences is that beyond extinct, you know, just that what's instinctive for me to do or for you to do, I try to analyze it and um, reach the highest quality. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you could get a little or a lot, it makes a big difference. And but it, in, in general, we do this all the time. Right. If, if I told you. You say, I need to have a ride. And I say, you know what? You can use my car. Here's the keys. And the car costs $200. Take that car, no problem. Right. I go, yeah, the car costs $200,000. <laughs> you may not even want those keys. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different situation, yeah. <laughs> because the value just changed. Yeah. But but grasping value is super important. I, I, it's for moral philosophy, but it's, it's not just for that. It's also for logic. And, and I, I don't understand what they're talking about. Social science, which is what axiology it, when it's in the scientific formal axiology thing falls under as a social science, which has to do with how we behave and stuff and how, how groups behave and, and also can, works in, in psychology and stuff. You make all these value judgments. I mean, right. 
It, yeah. Like I said, though, it, it, value to an axiology is not limited to value in the sense of just a moral thing. And so like, like one atheist told me one time, Damien, that's just too complicated. Just say you're a moral theorist. And I go, but that would be wrong because I'm way more than that. Mm -hmm. Moral theorists would say I stop at morality. You no, know? I can tell you what's true, how to evaluate true. I can tell you what's beneficial, what's not beneficial. And it has, doesn't have to be a moral thing. Because guess what? There's a benefit to a certain kind of science, right? There's right. like, obviously, if you just, you know, look at something and make, if you're a scientist and you make a, a, a guess, that's not as good as actually doing peer-reviewed, you know, uh, studies. Yeah. And even peer-reviewed studies that you send out and then are, are reviewed again would certainly be a, a higher, you know, thing if everybody comes to a consensus of studies or a consensus of things, or, or it's re, 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 the reproducibility matters. So all yep. of a sudden, no, it all matters. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So uh, I guess, how did you go from that uh, to being an anarchist or, or labeling well, yourself so, as an right. anarchist? So, so almost, almost becoming an atheist was the, immediately, I was not a conservative. Right. Just like in value in general. You change your values, change your life. So I was conservative um, still, although I was not longer a Republican. I was basically a conservative from 2004 till 2006. Once I had 2006 and I realized that the Bible was untrue, well, then my whole foundation, like you said, of morality, my whole foundation of what I thought right and wrong is I thought gays were bad and all kinds of stuff. And, and I, so, but once I didn't have that pseudo morality, to hold up my belief system, then being a conservative seemed um, disgusting to me. Right. I guess is the best way I can explain that. But I wasn't going to run uh, and be a Democrat because not because uh, uh, I had not been one before, but simply because I was thinking a lot more and I felt yeah, they're not really doing stuff for people because I started realizing axiology in, in school too, because in school they told us, I had to take one class of morality, but it ba basically I feel like they let us down because it was basically a class of try not to get in trouble. Okay. That was not really teaching us what's moral, but, <laughs> right. but don't get caught. They, they, they say, don't record things because if you record it, then it's, it's down and then, you know, whatever. And so I felt like, what the hell? That sounds like immoral. Yeah. To me. Like that's, that's hiding immorality. <laughs> yeah. So, you know we're going to do stuff wrong, and so you're going to save us by us not recording ourselves. Mm, I'm thinking we're teaching the wrong thing. What if I could get some help making the correct decision the first time? But see, that's what I felt. <laughs> and, right. No, and I felt this, and I was real open at the time because I had just left conservatism, right. and I didn't know what to do, and I did want to have some sort of a foundation. I felt like, shit, man, what do I do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... um Okay, so I know other people are wrong, but how do I figure out what's freaking right? And how do I know how wrong those people were, even if they're wrong? Right, yeah. And so we took the, the class and we started learning this theory, that theory. And I'm, and I'm like, uh, how do we know which one's better? And they said, oh, well, gee, everyone just picks one that they like. And I thought, <laughs> <"Whoa>, <laughs> what? Well, that doesn't seem right. <laughs> what the shit? Oh, this sounds worse than, than the conservatism. Just pick whatever the shit I like. <laughs> yeah. So you're not saying some of these don't lead to more or, or less harm? Well, but then you would have to judge them. And I'm like, and why are we not doing that? Right. Why? why uh, whoa. <laughs> and so um, that's when I started going, well, how do we judge moralities? And they go, well, that's meta ethics. That's when people go in to get, you know, stuff. And I go, well, why aren't we teaching meta ethics? Right. Yeah. <laughs> we need to learn that. <laughs> and then I got in meta ethics. I'm like, wait a minute. How is meta ethics making its judgments? Well, they're doing axiological value judgments, whether or not they know they're doing this. Not even more maybe concerned of why don't they know that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why? Why? Because they they're making these the same things. And so that's when I started getting into axiology was like a beacon of hope for me because I, I realized I needed something to make me understand how to understand. Right. I was always open. I, I want, I, 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 first time in my life, I really wanted to do the right thing and I didn't know what that was. Looking for a little guidance. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for a little guidance. And so then I started, um, I, I read, um, 
this one book on the new psychology of axiology or something. Anyway, it's like a hundred dollar book. Even today, still, it's really expensive. Okay. And because, but I, I wanted to know because I was like, why are these books so expensive? That also pissed me off. What? Why do they price this shit that like nobody can afford? Yeah. If this shit's so great, why isn't it free? I mean, that's that really. That's why also why I started giving things for free. For sure. <laughs> I started going, hmm, yeah, which is also kind of an anarchist thinking, like, wait a minute. This is like the elite supporting each other. <laughs> this, <laughs> yeah. this doesn't seem like this is producing good. Yeah, it, it's keeping the the beneficial knowledge out of the hands of those who can't afford to have it, right? Right. right. Yeah, that that's not good. And they're yeah. like, oh, uh, morality is too – this one guy in the, in the sentence I liked, but then I maybe started questioning stuff. <laughs> Morality is too important to leave in the hands of religion or philosophy. It should be attacked or addressed by science. And I thought, great. Okay. But then I thought, and it shouldn't be left in the hands of academics or elites. Right. It should be given freely to the world. And yeah. so that's where you say, like, where did I become an uh, gung-ho <laughs> about being... An anarchist was right there. I realized, fuck this college bullshit is about elites helping elites. Right. And they're like, oh, well, you're doing real good. You can get really, you know, really far in psychology. And you're really, I was really good at critical thinking and everything. And I thought, every time they said that, though, all I thought is, and what happens to the people that can't afford it? Right, right. And why isn't this given to everybody? I just, it's just it made me like more and more hate the system. Not because of like some youth thing, but realizing this is injustice. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I started being anarchist. I didn't even know. And I, I went on to Facebook, I don't know, 2012 or something. I'm not 14. I'm not sure when. And I, and, um, I, had, I didn't even know. I was already being anarchist, but I just, I just, uh, 2006, I started being an activist. I just didn't, I was just trying to get free shit out and explain and tell people and help people. Yeah. And so I was just doing mutual aid and stuff and direct action. I didn't even know. And, uh, <laughs> well, cause all I, I did it out of compassion and I, and out of like, this is fucked up. In fact, that's why I stopped schooling. It's, I just, I couldn't even keep going in, in college. Cause it felt like, well, you'll just make good money. And I just thought, I just want to help people. I'm, I'm right. done. That done with this whole cap. I didn't know at the time, but this capitalist mindset of this, I can better myself. Right. Right. Great. And then I'll be good and set and wonderful and everything will be fine. And I'll have me. a good salary and I'll yeah. have a good house. Yeah. Easy life. <laughs> yeah. You know? And so I, I did the, the extremely, in a sense, financially stupid thing is I, I let my, my financial stuff go to ruin, hmm. but I saved my humanity. So, Hey, <laughs> give and take a little bit, I guess. <laughs> but so then when I went, when I went to Facebook and I hadn't met any anarchists or anything, or even knew that's what it was. And I started just saying my ideas. Mm -hmm. This is my ideas. This is wrong. That's wrong. This, this is what you do. And they're like, man, you're like an anarchist. And so I'm like, the hell's that? So right. I went and looked it up online. I went, Oh, maybe I'm an anarchist. I remember, uh, <laughs> years ago, like, uh, you had, I think a couple Facebook pages, there was like the axiological atheist, yes. the axiological uh, something else. And, and I remember I saw you post something and I, I commented, I said, you know, that sounds a lot like anarcho-communism. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was like, and uh, yeah, I think I was at the time, I was probably one of the only people I knew who had any like reading on anarchism, but I, that seemed really familiar, this thing. So yeah, well, well, and I don't know. You you may have been one of the ones because it was a few people, but it wasn't that many. It was a couple of people said it to me, and I thought, okay, and I went and looked, and I went, yeah, I hey, thought, that sounds man, pretty man, good. <laughs> anarchists sound like some good people. Holy yeah. shit! I, I, and so I I didn't do do a whole bunch of reading anarchism, but I started saying I was an anarchist and started you know just continuing almost to be doing what I was doing. Yeah, but yeah, I, I called myself an axiological leftist. Ah, uh, yeah, because axiology is my thing, and I, I realized leftist. But actually, um, I call myself something else. But right, right before that, because I started realizing I was a leftist more, or I needed to state that. Because at first, I thought, well, social anarchism. Everybody's is is a, is basically socialist, leftist, whatever, or something. You know. Mm. And, then I met people that were anarcho said they were anarcho capitalists, and I thought, 
<laughs> Wait the a sec. Fuck? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I com- 100% don't, don't agree with these people. What, what's wrong with these people? And at first, I was kind of friends. I tried to argue and talk with them. And I started going, I don't know. And so that's when um, I started calling myself a leftist and a socialist. Because I thought, oh shit, I need to make sure people know. I don't, I don't want people to think I'm an anarcho-capitalist. Right, right. And, and so um, I read a little bit more, but I just, I basically just uh, continued to do pretty much what I was already doing, <clears throat> what I felt, anyways. Right. And I, I recently took a test that someone told me they wanted me to. I took a political test, and it said that um, I'm basically closest to an anarcho-communist. Right. So I was like, okay. Yeah, I've never taken one of those things and I've gotten 100% a thing, but usually it's like 95% anarcho-communism, 90% socialist libertarian. or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like, okay, these are what I am then. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I, what I, I, I was like, okay. Because I always called myself a socialist, mutualist, collectivist, anarchist. Right. But that's just, I was just, and the reason why I was always trying to be clarifying, because I wanted the people to understand where I'm coming from. For sure. Because yeah. I didn't want the confusion, because I, like I said, especially when I started hearing some people talk, like, oh man, I don't agree with some of these people. Right. Like the when I first started exploring uh, anarchism, I was hearing the term libertarian a lot. And there was like libertarian parties in the United States and Canada. And, and I, I agreed with a lot of the things that they said. But they were clearly like very pro-capitalist type people, and I was I was starting to learn that capitalism was not cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, and I, I went to one speaking of libertarian, and I think I called it li- my my before I called it li- uh, um, axiological leftist. I think I called it libertarian anarchist or something. I don't remember now, but something like that. Right. But I went to one libertarian meetup. And I heard them all talk, and and the guy's like, "Oh, I hope you can come back." And I said, "There's no fucking way I'm coming." <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I am not. <laughs> no way. And they're like, "Oh, you had some really good things to say." And I said, "I am not coming back here." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You and I might agree I, against I, about the state, but we do not agree about anything else. <laughs> oh, but, not, but once again, because of my value focus. The reason they don't like the state is not exactly the reason I don't. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, I, I, and yeah, and they're, they're like saying all this about taxes and stuff. I'm like, look, taxes doesn't really the one the part that bothers me. Right. Yeah. It's really that the, the lack of caring for people in need, the homeless on the freaking street starving. Yeah. It's, right. the, it's the fact that, that you allow, you know, rich people to get off without getting, you know, punished for due cause. I mean, just it just the unfair system, the the racism, the sexism, the homophobia, the all all the bullshit. Yeah, and the, the elitism, and it just and like I said, the schooling. Why doesn't all school college should be free? What the fuck? You know, just I, it just and not and, and like I said, not not housing people. I mean, just the whole the whole thing really is dog shit to me. So yeah, no, it's- and 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 so I've been saying even even the the. Even if some of the stuff can be kind of similar, it still is. It, Their no. reasoning is, yeah, yeah. Because they're still pro-capital, like they they really are still okay with suffering. <laughs> oh, totally. And I'm so, not. See, that's what I'm saying is I'm not. Yeah. I just am not. I, 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 my goal is to be a good person. I just cannot put that together with acting like that. Mm-hmm. And, and so to me, I felt like, you know, a lot of anarchists were were, were semi, you know, um, trying to be good people, too. Although then I read read some stuff that, you know, like um, they're anti-Semitic or or, 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 or or sexist. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. It's I guess depending on how you look at it, anarchism is a very big thing. Right with different groups within it that seem to make more sense to my values than others. And yeah, sometimes you get some toxic shit in there, I guess. Yeah. But, but I realized that once again, it's not the, it's not like they had tarnished anarchism. Right. (laughs) Yeah. It's just their views and them as an anarchist. Yeah. So it didn't, it, it didn't like, 
taint anarchism for me. It tainted their their thing, but I already was not into worshiping people. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which is so, also kind of part of anarchism, right? <laughs> like, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so so it just fits into the whole thing to be like, well, I mean, we disagree, and I disagree with this this all this stuff that you do and say over here. And I'm just not going to agree with you on that. It's fine. And I, and I realize that ideas are not limited to the person. Yeah. Just because a person, in a sense, conceives of an idea, it doesn't mean it's limited to the person. Right, right. This is this is something that I seem to encounter a lot, like with uh, like the idea of Marxism. Like Marx didn't come up with socialism, right? Like that was a thing that right. predated oh, yeah. him. Definitely. And, <laughs> and so, so to call it Marxism... Like you have to be referring specifically to his theories, which weren't perfect. Like <laughs> he's not a god. <laughs> well, but <laughs> I, I think being. in general that people like authoritarians. They like well, just like like the Bible. They like the ease and comfort. Even some anarchists, it seems like mm. like the ease and comfort of someone who's smart just telling you what the fuck to do. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and it would be great if all people were trustable, which they're not. So even even if someone is smart and even if they are great, they can still make errors. Yep. You should not blindly follow them into the dustbin. Yep. I mean, it doesn't matter. And that, that would go for me, too, even if someone liked my ideas. I don't think that you should blindly follow what I do unless it's worthy, right. which is why going back to the axiology thing. That's why I think it's important to teach people how to know what is worthy, what is true, what is accurate, and how to discern between these things. You're going to make the, the, the judgments anyways. You might as well make them with a better, you know, accuracy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Try to make them as, as accurate as possible and based on the most uh, robust reasoning possible. Right. And then I realized <clears throat> that we need to actually have belief etiquette. This is real important. No matter who you are, no matter what you're doing, you should have a good belief etiquette. In other words, reason, belief, acquisitions. What you let come in, you should try to analyze it, period. Mm -hmm. doesn't even matter what it is. Then you should have good belief maintenance. That you take those beliefs that you already accepted sometimes without doing it in a, in a, in a sense, <laughs> reasoned way. It's going to be emotional. It could be just what happenstance. No matter what it was, even reasoned, can look different on new facts. Science does this all the time. We should do the same thing. Right. We should reassess, is this still accurate and how accurate? Yeah. It's not an all or nothing, right? Some things that could be kind of accurate, you know, and some things that could be still real close and things are way off. And that goes to the, other, the third thing is that we should have honest belief relinquishment. We should be willing to let it all go mm -hmm. if it's not found worthy. And we should only keep the parts that are. We shouldn't be trying to polish turds. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was reading something just yesterday about uh, uh, the using the metaphor of breaking up with bad ideas or breaking up oh, yeah. with bad ideologies or bad states or bad, you know, breaking up is a good thing. It's healthy. <laughs> well, and, 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 and we need to be honest about it. And what I mean is with ourselves. Hmm. Yeah. That we have an honesty that, that we seek the truth, that we seek what is just, what is good, what is what is accurate, which is true. And that we're willing to say, you know what, sometimes I make mistakes. The error could be unintentional. Yep. But that doesn't mean we should just keep to the error no matter what. That seems to be the hard part for I, I, almost everybody. Like I'm including myself in that, like the uh, to admit that I'm mistaken uh, is it's difficult. <laughs> well, and, and that, that's why I'm very against ego, because right. the reason it's difficult often comes down to ego. Right. We don't want to look bad. We don't want to look wrong. We don't want to look like we have to change because then we have to somehow adopt stuff. And the reason why adopting stuff can be hard is because we're not accurate or good at it. Mm -hmm. So that means we have to stay in this uneasy, you know, like newbie type of thing. And, and we want to be totally confident, totally accurate, and totally whatever, all the time, and that's toxic. Yeah, yeah. Which, And really, you should be constantly being like, well, I don't know. I'm not sure if I'm right about this. <laughs> and, right. Well, and like I said, that, that it, to me, I, I grasp how much it's an ego thing. Mm -hmm. 
in general to protect ourselves that seem being wrong to be having to change to yeah. having to adapt or that when we do adapt we we it's like every expert at every single thing ever known was a beginner at some point right and didn't know and had to learn and had to make mistakes yep. everyone and I constantly try to remember this because ego would like me to think that I'm an expert at everything and I'm great. And then if I do learn, I'll learn it all super fast without mistakes, you know, but it's, it's actually toxic to think this way. Yeah. Like I said, that's why uh, I find nihilism bad for me because it's an, like an anti-axiology, which that to me already is a problem mm -hmm. in all kinds of ways. And then egoism I see as a problem because of the ego problem that is a toxic way of thinking and being. And so to me, even though they're they're I don't I'm not lumping them together as one thing, they have similar toxic uh, relating to me that I just I can't deal with that. Right. And right. I don't want to. But like I, I've said before, I'm not saying those people are not anarchists. They're just anarchists I don't want to deal with. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because when it comes to anarcho capitalist, they're not anarchists. Right. They're me. literally not anarchists. <laughs> <laughs> you're, not. you're not. You're not a selfish anarchist. You are not an anarchist. Stop using the uh, the prefix, uh, please. <laughs> yeah. I heard someone say that they felt bad for them that they, they get picked on. Well, if they don't want to get picked on, turn into a real anarchist. How yeah, about that? That's right. Change the way you <laughs> view the world. Change your right. ideas. Yeah. Right, it's like saying someone doesn't want to be picked on for being a conservative. Oh, then stop being a conservative. Maybe that'll help. I'm sure it would. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure. And I'm saying that from someone who used to be a conservative. Yeah, I spent a few years as a conservative myself, and uh, it's it's uh, it's odd looking back on it. <laughs> it. It's amazing to me that it took so long. But that's why I, I focus so much on religion is because I realize this is a stumbling block. Right. If I would have removed religion, I never would have gone 35 years of my life believing in conservatism. Right, it right. Fucking wouldn't have happened. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't quite, I didn't do that that long. I was probably, uh, I would say max 10 years a conservative. And no, mostly, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, well, like I said, I, I would say probably I, I started maybe 14 or something, 15, I don't know, probably 14. Yeah. Somewhere around there. And uh, all the way until 35. Right. Yeah. So a long time. <laughs> long enough. <laughs> yeah. And then I used, to, I used to, to be mean to homeless people and hated gay people. and Right. Um, yeah. yeah and, and I looked down at people even on welfare and stuff. I used to have a bumper sticker that said, work hard. There's millions of welfare that are counting on you. And I had, a, I had a sticker too that said, you know, when all else fails, read directions. And I had a picture of the Bible. I was a oh. fanatic. <laughs> <laughs> I might have given you the finger if I saw it. <laughs> yeah, I deserved it though. <laughs> but I'm just saying, so it, it's funny, you know, when these people are like, oh, you just have always been that pog. No. <laughs> no. No. Yeah. Every, every single thing that they think is wrong. Uh, okay, I was super violent. So me being super kind now is... Is totally a character choice right. because of axiology. Like I said, and also, like I said, I received undeserved kindness, which I realize is a very axiological thing to do. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> to suppose, realize yeah. that the value of being that way, and I, I realize that a leader, you know, is is not these people that they they put little name tags on. Leaders of behavior, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be a leader that showed that kindness matters, right and and. And I and, I, and so it's like for me, like in the, in the um, uh, people going punch Nazis or whatever. I, I'm not saying that I want to debate them either more than I want to debate someone who's a conservative, or MAGA, or I, I want to debate someone who's a nihilist. I already have a video of me debating Christian nihilist, and he actually stopped being a nihilist after talking to me. But I, I, I'm not doing that anymore. I don't care right. to do it. Uh, my point is not that it's not valuable. It is, but I already spent, you know, like 15 years or whatever since 2006 until like this is last year, I think, or something. Yeah. I stopped direct action where I was, I'd fight anybody. Right. Take anyone on. And uh, that's not, I, I want to teach now. I, that's my goal. And speaking of teaching, that's one of the things that I, I so I got into to, um, 
archaeology. I started learning stuff and I started learning more stuff and I started just teaching it and, and we're putting out, you know, blogs and stuff for free hmm. and started uh, trying to make videos. But I realized, you know, my, my thing was more about showing the facts and it's really kind of hard. I wasn't good at videos. And, and it, so I, I, not that I'm not good at talking, but. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. But, but, but I, and, and I also, um, I just wanted to have the facts. I didn't want to make errors. And I knew that if I, if I, you know, do stuff reading or whatever, I could make errors at mm. the time because I didn't know everything. So I just wanted to show people I'd learn and I would just immediately share it. Right. And then, then I started forming some of my own opinions from learning a lot of stuff. Cause at first uh, I was only going to do um, like, I was going to write a book and I was only going to do it to, to basically go back to Tepe just uh, 12,000 years ago in Turkey. And then maybe, little bit down, but not much. And then just talk about religion and then be done. Okay. But uh, that evolved because I started realizing, well, wait a minute. This, I see this as maybe paganism or early paganism or something that led to paganism. But something started before that. And then I realized, oh, that's shamanism. So oh, I got to learn about shamanism. And I started <laughs> learning about shamanism. And I'm like, well, there was actually something before that. Right. <laughs> and I thought... <laughs> Well, if I'm really going to talk about it and understand this stuff, I probably should learn about that. So I started learning about totemism. And then I learned, well, there's actually stuff before that. So I started learning about animism. And I started, well, there's actually stuff even in a sense before that. Right. <laughs> so, but the more I, I learned, though, the more I realized that there's such humanness. Like people are like, could you ever believe in religion? Fuck no. No way. It's, 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 it's culture to me. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's culture. As much as language is culture is tied to it. Religion is culture. It's just these cultural stories that got spread around. Right. For several different reasons. I mean, that's why I, I don't, and I know for one thing that it's wrong when people say like, or I mean, atheists will say, oh, religion started because of fear of lightning. Yeah, that's not true at all. <laughs> just stop saying that. Shit. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. First off, if you mean where religion started, I would say animism in Africa. And those people are so one with nature, they actually steal food from lions on a, on a common basis. And they don't even use weapons or hurt the lions. Mm. <laughs> They're not afraid of lightning. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because it's part of the world, right? Yeah. 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 They, they, well, in, in fact, it's not until you totemism and you get some sort of evil forces in a sense. Right. You don't you don't have that in animism. Animism, everything is magical, but everything is in a sense in a balance or whatever. So it's more about like keeping things in balance and not overusing. It's almost like being hippie-ish sort of okay. mentality. It's not it it it's 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 seeing magical agency in the world, but that's also like <clears throat> Really, you don't have a lot of afterlife with stuff with an animus because there's no such thing. Right. And what I mean is there's no such thing as a difference between anything. It's all magical in a sense. So <laughs> there's no like, oh, it'll be different later. It's different now for them. Right, right. The existence <laughs> so no, of being is, is magical. Yeah, existence of being is existence of being. Yeah. They don't have a lot of. There's not a lot in, 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 um, animism by itself, in a sense, doesn't directly have, in a sense, a full ancestor worship mm-hmm. because everything is still the same sort of okay. how they how they see it. And, and, and also to them later, you know, a totemism, a plant could be or an animal specific one could matter. But to, to an animist, that, that would be a weird thing. You're choosing almost arbitrarily that certain animals are more important or not sacred or profane. That's a totemist type of thinking more than an animist one. Okay. Animist with, that's like a hippie or something. We're all, uh, we're all matter, man. We're all, you know, it's got to, got to, got to keep with the flow or something. That's way more. Right. It's like, see, in fact, some people, I heard this one um, person who, um, is an Alaskan native and went down and stayed with animus and said, I didn't even notice they had religion. Well, cause they don't do something specifically different. It's a thinking. Right. Right. It's, they don't have pastors or things. They don't go only to church on Sundays. You know, their <laughs> whole world is magical Yeah, all the time. That's why I'm saying it's, it's, 
But anyways, so learning all this stuff, though, it, it made me super hardcore atheist, but it also made me a lot more compassionate than right. I had ever been or I would have been just as an atheist. Because I, even though I see religion as 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 not helpful, I I, I see it in a, with a more varied lens and whatever, a more accuracy. Right. Yeah. Like it's like axiology. You know, <laughs> belief comes from somewhere. It evolved out of these other things, and it's like not just a. Yeah, well, they're not the same. Yeah. Is what I mean is that you can't value judge the the harm of a, someone being an animist and then the harm of someone being a full fledged you know fanatical, you know, nationalist Christian. Right. Uh, I pick an animist any day. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you look at an, an, an animist society, they're what we would call anarchist. Right. Anarcho communist or whatever, socialist. I mean, they, they absolutely are nothing. Their whole system is is geared towards the group and everyone's equal children are equal women are equal rape almost doesn't exist i mean it's more like what i would consider that boy we that's another thing too i learned is by going back and actually learning about these really old societies i really learned that wow they have a lot to teach us that we right. think we're so knowledgeable and here they're doing it and one of the things that they do is they do prestige avoidance okay which is in a sense attacking ego. Right, right. No one should say how great they are. No one should make that their stuff is doing more or that they're special. Interesting. Um, like, like that's a healthy thing. That's why I said I, I grasp really quick as an axiologist. That's a good thing. Yeah. That, 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 that doing that to realizing that we're equal. That we are equal. We just need to start acting like it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So I guess uh, we're over an hour now, but so okay. where can people find more about this stuff from you? Well, um, I have um, my uh, website is Damien Marie at hope is a T H O P E dot com. Perfect. And uh, I have a website um, that has all of my stuff on it. So ev everything's linked on the first page. Right on. And we, uh, uh, we do, a show every two weeks on uh, uh, on your YouTube channel. So yeah, yeah, we do we do different stuff. Mainly, um, we do everything from a leftist, anarchist, socialist bent. Yeah. So even if we talk about prehistory, it will not be limited to what a dry prehistory. Right. Yeah, we do try to have some commentary about how that, like a little bit of workers' liberation thrown in there every now and then. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And uh, do you still have a Patreon? No, I uh, got rid of my patron. Um, okay. Two reasons. One reason was the main reason is <clears throat> once I had been kicked off of Facebook and you got kicked off of LinkedIn and got kicked off of Instagram, mm. I had a bunch of stuff. I mean, I had like 40 um, articles on LinkedIn. Right. And I, I that, 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 that was, it was, I had like probably 100,000 followers on Facebook, but I had probably maybe only twelve or fourteen thousand. I can't remember that on um, LinkedIn, but a lot of them were archaeologists and historians. Right. Probably half the people that follow me. That was to me the most devastating because I had people I was interacting with in a very genuine way on really complex topics that I can't do at all right. anymore. Yeah, and so yeah. that that was that was really hard. But I but I had a whole bunch of stuff linked through them. And so I needed to fix my whole website. Everything was messed up. And I had like, you know, 450 pages and I had like 450 pages on my, um, a patron, which I did free. I never even charged for my patron. And so I needed to fix too much. And I, I, I want to move on with my life and I had too much stuff to do. And so I just closed the patron down. And I really had started it with with trying to help my direct action because I was like flying, you know, places right. to, in the country to go to conventions and going to uh, do activism events and stuff. So I, I needed more money because I was spending a lot. Yeah. And uh, but after, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore. It, it I had less desire to keep my patron. And so I just got rid of it. I never did this for money. Like some people, you know, uh, and I, I mean, 
my my uh, wife takes care of me. I, I don't work. My wife uh, supports me, and I want to get into doing the jewelry business so I can um, help support us also. So, but as far as that other stuff, you know, everything's still out there free on my website. Yep, and you are still publishing new stuff all uh, as well. So. Yeah, not as often. I was producing a lot, but now I'm doing a lot less. But I'm still doing stuff, and and we're, uh, soon after we're done with the um, talk about Mesopotamia, I want to do stuff about homelessness and um, some other other stuff I want to address. Sure. Oh, it'll be good. Well, thank you very much for your time, Damien, and uh, have a good one. All right. See ya. All right, folks, that's everything. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical, skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a and a review on the podcast app of your choice or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check my website, skepticalleftist.com. There you can check out my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics. Uh, you can check out the videos that I do with my friend Damien Maria at Hope and all my old content from the Brainstorm podcast. You can also find the links to my Discord, Reddit, and Twitch. Uh, you can contact me through my website or by emailing mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. Thanks so much for watching or listening, and try to get involved with something in your area. And let's all work to make the world a better place. <laughs> <laughs>